HiSec Buyback offers a 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talking in Stations. We are streaming again on a Monday because we've been busy this Sunday, and uh, I am joined by guests from Brave. I actually have Shattered Armor here and Wolfie. If you guys want to give us quick intros of yourself, I'll start with Shattered. Good afternoon, folks. As Rain just said, my name is Shattered Armor. I am the military director of Brave Collective. All right, and then Wolfie. Yeah, hi, I'm Wolfie Alex Strauss. I'm Brave Collective's chief of staff. Alrighty, welcome to the show. I believe it's been a while, but I believe this is the first time we've had either of you on. So I'm excited to get to talk to you and uh, showcase your thoughts and opinions of this war to our audience. So today's topic, oh, I should throw out there, I forgot to introduce Artemis. Artemis is in the background. She's probably not going to be saying much, but all the stuff you see on screen is Artemis. If you can't hear us, that's also Artemis's fault, so blame her. But we're going to be talking about the war, and we vaguely call it the war in the title. I don't believe anyone's given it a fancy, catchy name yet, but this is the war that's currently going on in the quote-unquote north between Fraternity and B2, but then by extension, it's Fraternity and PanFam versus B2, which is Brave and Blob slash Volta, and then by extension, Imperium. Have I... I, I'm hoping I say that properly. Would you agree with that, Wolfie and Shattered? Did I miss anyone or anything important there with the intro? I think they covered all the major players in the war, yeah. All right, sweet. So I think, oh, I should throw in fire because B2 now has fire. Okay, I forgot about them. But yes, I, I'm hoping I catch all the major players. So, But from the war perspective, this is going to be Brave's perspective. Or I, I want to say you guys are both the defenders and the attackers in this war. Is that correct? I believe that depends on which Reddit post you decide to open that day. Well, I don't read Reddit, so I'd rather hear, like, how, how do you see the war shattered if you're doing military stuff? How would you see it? Well, the one thing people can't really deny is that nine months ago, approaching ten months now, we were invaded by Winter Coalition. Nereus declared their intentions to evict the GTC, and by extension us, because we were their allies at the time, unofficially, but obviously that changed in light of that situation. So since last July, early July of 2022, we have basically been manning the walls of the North. We've been trying to hold our ground against a coalition that is several times our size, albeit in a much different time zone, and I would argue we would be doing so quite successfully for that duration. Alrighty, and so maybe to take a step back at a high level, so you mentioned like six, what'd you say, nine, six months ago? So there was the original war between Fraternity and GTC. I, I want to say that ended, but I don't really think it truly ended. I think it just kind of fizzled out, and that's when B2 was formed. Volta and Bray finally said, you know what, we're being good allies. We're probably the smallest, you know, alliances out here in Null. Let's group up and kind of like at least be able to defend our space against our powerful neighbors. Because like you said, you had fraternity or winter coalition on one side, but then on the opposite side, you also had, I believe it's initiative down in Fountain. So at least like maybe not neighbor neighbor, but like close enough to where, you know, you have these giant forces, at least compared to Brave and Blob. And so, and then more recently, I believe it was within the last month slash couple weeks, fighting has kicked off again. Fraternity officially declares war on B2. You guys retaliated in response. You've called in the Imperium. And fighting has been taken off, I would say, for the last week since last Sunday. Pretty much. I, I will add, though, as a bit of a side note, this isn't the first time that Winterco has tried to invade North and invade Volta Space. This happened again about almost a Two years ago, I know, I want to say. They tried to do this. It didn't work. They didn't have the manpower. Volta was able to hold their own. Fraternity came, gave up and went home. And then this kicked off again this previous summer with them essentially, I don't want to say feeling betrayed, but feeling as though they thought they had the ability to muscle us out of the picture and make sure that Brave would sit on the sidelines while Fraternity swept through the North. Obviously, that didn't happen. We, we picked our uh, picked our side in that fight, and 
the rest, well, as they say, is history. Alrighty, so battles have been taking place, and you're the you're the military director. How have how have those battles looked for you? Like, have you been? I don't want to say have you been participating in every battle, but have you participated in the major battles then? I've been present for most of the stuff that's occurred over the past couple weeks. Yep, and obviously for the duration of the war that we were fighting before the Imperium got involved, we were around. Alrighty, and so. I want to kind of take us. It feels like I feel like we've done this show before, but this was with Jinx and Starfleet Commander, so I might be mixing up some of their history with what I'm saying now. So feel free to correct me. But uh, they they announced B two. You guys kind of all got settled. You invited Fire to come stay with you because Pan Fam kicked out Fire from their space, and then it seems like Fire just got settled, and then Fraternity declared their war. And then I'm thinking from like a high level, if you have just Fraternity or Winter Coalition versus b2 plus fire like that's kind of smaller coalitions in the grand scheme of things but now both pan fam and imperium are involved can you explain to me how pan fam and, and, and imperium got involved from your perspective so, so originally starting in around october the pan fam sig bean thorn legion bfl they deployed to our space they deployed to x tax 70 and they did so with the intention of essentially third partying is i believe the the narrative that's being written from their side they decided to show up to get in on these fights cash in on the fighting that was going on between gtc brave and winterco generally for the first few weeks they were somewhat playing back and forth but it very quickly devolved into realizing that they're a USTZ strong coalition, and Fraternity doesn't really have a USTZ. So there is very little for them to fight in the North that wasn't just Brave and GTC. So memes and spin aside, when the strongest PvP SIG in the entirety of PanFam deploys to this area and spends 90% of their day fighting our coalition, it tipped the scales pretty heavily against us, and so it turned into a where we had a pretty strong dominance in EU and USTZ to much more of a parity as for the fighting goes, because they were able to form... Being Foreign Legion can put approximately 200 pilots on a grid if they need to, so it's not a small presence in any sort of fight. They're definitely able to tip the scales in a favor as of their choosing. That went on until approximately early January, at which point, we knew this was coming anyways, but at which point PanFam, or sorry, yeah, PanFam declared war on fire. Fire, knowing that they didn't really have the ability to put up a fight against a coalition that large, didn't put up a fight, and they made a, a tactical retreat to move their assets up through Losec and through some parts of Nullsec, where they were able to secure Tether. And then they made their way into fire space, or sorry, B2 space, which was at the time still GTC, because we hadn't cemented our coalition yet at that point. Which was very unexpected for us, because uh, we were not, uh, we were, we were, you know, we were sad to see BFL go, because we were having some good fights with them. And uh, we highly expected that when PanFam was done glassing fire space, they would be back. We just didn't expect fire to also be up in the north at that point it was definitely a little bit unexpected it was an unintended like un unintended consequence but it's it's worked out we've gotten some good fights with them yeah right off the bat we were fairly well aware that this was going to draw some more attention up in the north having a very large very predominantly cn and ru chinese and russian time zone coalition moving into this area where there's been a lot of fighting in Chinese and EUTZ up until that point. So we were definitely curious and watching to see how the other players in Nullsec would react to this. And it was pretty much what we expected. The moment that Fire had themselves settled down in the north, they, they began poking around for content. We began seeing what our numbers look like versus Fraternity when they would come for our, come for our timers and we would try to remove we would play against their timers in our space and uh, 
I'll frame you to cat in the back. It's cute. That's my cat's doing the same. She keeps meowing at me. Yeah. That's why you should be on camera. Mine are chasing each other around my bedroom. It's really cute. But uh, yeah, they the we formed some fights in CNTZ to see what our numbers look like, and it was a, looking a lot looking a lot more of a even engagement for the day to day things. But obviously, when you're playing with the largest Chinese coalition in the game, when they need to form hard and form heavy, they can ping pretty relentlessly if they have to. And numbers from both sides. The the gap was narrowing, but there was still definitely a pretty major numbers disparity in fraternities prime time. So and, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna ask a clarifying question because you had Fire join you. But Fire I was gonna say B two really doesn't have like in the grand scheme of alliances, you guys don't have that much space. Like I'm thinking Panfam has all the drones, if you look at how much fraternity or space fraternity has, and even some of Imperium where they have at least three, four, five regions sort of thing. But from B two's perspective, you suddenly have Fire join you and was Fire was it the intent of Fire to take o take branch from fraternity? Am I remembering that correctly? Or were they gonna or were they pointed to settle somewhere else generally let's go ahead we'll feel this is more your area anyways <laughs> yeah at the uh, at the start of things branch is definitely one spot where we plan to put them there there are a lot of smaller alliances put together and they need their own space we can't we can't have them on our couch forever they don't want to be there we don't want them there so the goal is to get them settled down at some point in in what is currently frat space okay so from there, then, you have an incentive to fight fraternity, not just a defensive war, which I think is how it was initially in the quote-unquote fighting in the few months past. But now it's more of gone from defensive to offensive, where you have an incentive and a drive to actually take fraternity space rather than just keep them off your doorstep. Yeah, I definitely say so. We were definitely playing the defense for like the last nine months or so. It's, it's nice to be on the offensive again. That that's definitely the way that things are going. That's with all the dead keep stars this week. It's it's the start of that major push into their territory. Okay, and so Shadow, I know you were talking about B two showing up and then the start of the next war. I think my initial question was, how did Imperium get involved? Because when I when I look at the history of this, I think maybe at most, I think it was Initiative. I think that maybe came up and would do some fighting, you know, quote unquote third partying. But how is it all of Imperium getting involved now as compared to months past? So. The interesting thing about when this game exists as a sort of a red versus blue climate in Nullsec, you have, you know, Team A, PanFam, and all their supporters, Slice, Winter Coalition, Fraternity, all those groups. And then you have the Imperium on the other team, and you have all their supporters. You have groups like Sigma and Initiative and other those other, you know, smaller groups, uh, Dracaris as well, that support the Initiative. The Imperium. And so these two groups exist not so much in spite of one another, but they're always watching each other with bated breath. It's it's two global superpowers, right? It's like it's the, the US versus Russia dynamic. They they do not, you know, they do not sit by and ignore what the other team is doing because it affects them one way or another and they need to respond from a political and a military standpoint. So when PanFam, so groups like Pandemic Horde, Northern Coalition, Pandemic Legion, Slice, groups like that, when they started escalating their presence in Pure Blind, this then turned into a, well, they're now encroaching on not the Imperium's borders, but places where that coalition has an interest. Because as we, as Winter Coalition being a PanFam affiliated coalition, if they were to succeed in their aims of conquering the North and removing the B B2 from Branch, Declan, sorry, Declan, Pure Blind, and the northern half of Cloud Ring, as well as Fade itself, that now means that PanFam's affiliates now share a border with the Imperium. Because the southern half of Cloud Ring currently belongs to the Imperium, the northern half of Cloud Ring currently belongs to us, and that's where the border is drawn. So by pushing that border pushing that border that creates a very hot spot like very potential for conflict because once they control that space they can just drop some keep stars down and if they decided to they can move their entire super fleet up to imperium's border that day 
So that definitely, they definitely have to be aware of what the what those groups are doing and how they're moving. And what we saw in the the weeks leading up to the Imperium deploying is we saw BFL redeploy back to the north. We saw Northern Coalition begin a alliance deployment to the north as well. And at this time, rather than staging out of a pandemic horde Fortizar like they had been in NPC Null, this time around they were staging out of a fraternity Keepstar in the system of X-47, which I'm sure many of you have seen have been, has been the hotspot of many spicy engagements so far, being the now only remaining Keepstar that Fraternity has deployed in Pure Blind, given that we have subsequently killed the rest of them, but where they seem to be cementing their Western fortifications for the, for the foreseeable future. So then, kind of curiosity question, before we start delving into battles, you mentioned key, all the rest of Keepstars in Pure Blind have died. Has... So then is B2's next objective then, or should I say, yeah, I guess B2 and allies, is the next objective then to destroy that keep star, or are you guys going to focus your objectives elsewhere? Like, I'm trying to think of the grand scale of military strategy, right? Like, I, I always assumed trying to breach a regional gate into Declan or Branch or any of these other regions is more difficult than it would be structure bashing a keep star, but I, I'm just curious. Well, now this is where we start getting into the realm of things where I have to think about what I am and am not able to say at this time. So I'll have to give it some thought. But the interesting thing, if you look at Dotland, you can look at Dotland or you can look at an in-game map and you'll see pretty early on what the geogra geography of the, the borders. The reason that we are able to hold Declan and Fade and Pure Blind and why Fraternity has run up a ground against the regional divide between Declan, Branch, and Venal and them is because if you look at the map in game, you'll see these massive regional gates. You'll see the Y19 crossing between Declan and Branch, and then you'll see the WLF crossing between Venal and Declan. And these are system these are the 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 regional gates that you cannot physically jump a capital through. And even in soft warfare, even in just general skirmishing, trying to kill structures. Your ability to project capitals is a huge deciding factor in how much, or how much you're able to swing a fight in your favor. And so, by controlling access to those regions through those two gates, because Declan is essentially geographically isolated from the rest of, from fraternity space through those two regional crossings, there's no way for them to actually maneuver fleets and if they wanted to go so far as to bring super capital assets into our space they're very much limited through approaching through tribute through the x47 route they don't have any way to project power but consequently that also means that we have difficulty projecting into those regions as well the other really interesting concept here is is, is you'll see a lot of talk about during big fights you'll see a talk about like jammer nets and leveraging solves and solve no advantages like Ansiblexes and Tenebrexes to harden your borders and uh, resist yourself to attack. Like We have huge swaths of Fade and Pure Blind defensively Sino-Jammed basically 24-7. And that's because it gives us huge defensive advantages if we can determine that we are allowed to maneuver through that space, deploy capitals, turn those jammers on and off as required, whereas the attackers, the uh, our opponents in Winterco, cannot use capitals in that space. And we saw very early on that that is not just a force multiplier, but is also uh, functions as a, as a deterrent because they're more hesitant to bring fleets into our space if they cannot reinforce those fleets through the use of triage and dreadnought escalation, as well as super cap escalation if necessary. Now, yeah. the real interesting part about this whole thing is Venal, which is smack dab in the middle of frat space, is NPC null, which means... It's a completely level playing field. Either side can play for structures and put assets in that region without worrying about the other the other side's ability to deny that deny that ground, basically. So Venal is a very interesting region that if anyone here is a armchair general or keeping a close eye on this war, that's something you might want to keep an eye on. Yeah, Venal I know has lots of activity just from 
I mean, I was it was a staging for Black Legion. A lot of players will stage there for money making purposes with running burner missions. Lots of random what is it, stations and whatnot, yeah. You got K three J and H P plus others that you can easily like dreads can fit in those up uh, NPC stations pretty easily. And then you can stage them from there. So when people are moving capitals around, it's really easy to hot drop them. I know. Sorry, Artemis was showing that. So curiosity question then. I'm going to segue for a question to Wolfie. I know, so I know BFL deployed and then Imperium were volunteering to to come fight with B2. I know you've been doing a lot of the, the diplomatic work. Was it really that easy to convince all of Imperium to come up and help? Because I believe they'd moved more than just subcaps and SIGs. It was more of, I believe they also, I want to say they moved capitals, but I actually don't have confirmation of that. But that's everything I've heard. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't that hard to convince them ultimately. We had definitely been considering stuff with Imperium for a while. Like we we don't want to end up ha getting stuck to the point where we've got half the game blue again by actually joining the their coalition. That's that's not really what we want. But at the same time, with Frat and Horde attacking us, you know that that there's not a small alliance in the game that can really withstand that for potentially like a month or or a you know a year. Having them team up was definitely a strain. So. What kind of ended up happening is fire got pushed out of their space and they got negotiated through through Imperium space to come and join us. And then uh, from that point, we kind of decided we were tired of being on the defensive. Once we got them settled down, we ended up speaking to the Imperium about having them come up. They have brought capitals and supers. I, I know a lot of the game probably saw the move ops and stuff. It's kind of hard to hide. At, at this point, it, we're pretty much on the defensive play with, with the Imperium. We're, coordinating everything that we do when we're taking steps to attack space it's uh, they're they're definitely joining us as, as equal allies in the fight at this point it's not a defensive war anymore all righty so that's that's good to hear and yeah that's what i was i kind of been hitting on it the off offensive slash defensive right because you guys are clearing out fraternity structures in pure blind area but then if you want to get truly offensive you have to go in and actually start taking fraternity space i don't know I think over the last week we tried looking at, was it last week or the week before we tried looking at timer boards to say like, hey, is any saw of actually getting hit and or flipped? But I don't think we actually were able to pull some up. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys have any insight there. Are you guys starting to take iHubs? Are you starting to defend iHubs? How's that looking? Thanks for reminding me that there is currently no third party saw timer board at the moment ever since uh, timerboard.net died. <laughs> it's a damn shame to see yeah. that. Yeah. I use that all the time when I would do streaming stuff was, for like these was, sites. It was critical during the during the previous wars, and uh, now we're actually, unironically, one of the only that's currently hosting a t public timer board is actually Fraternity. They they basically took the git from that old board and they they made it their own. But yeah, somebody wants to have partner. That's a that's a good way to do it. It's definitely yep. a tool that the game needs. Oh, well, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but. Uh, no, there's been a little bit of poking. Taking Sov is not necessarily the the first thing you do when you're invading space. Typically, the first thing you do is you suppress the Sov, Sovereignty first. You do things like cloaky camping, blops drops. We'll do blackouts where you go and you hit all the Anseblexes and turn off all the Anseblexes in a single night so they, they basically have no way to maneuver. Things like this, that's which basically level the playing field for the attacker and the defender because defenders have such massive advantages in the current sovereignty and uh, nullsec system that you need to plan your attacks weeks in advance for how you actually plan to uh, or what objectives you're going to push and uh, and how you go about it but definitely the first the first kind of steps you take when you're trying to invade Sovereignty, especially sovereignty, which is defended by such a large group as fraternity, because it's very trivial for them to run around in Chinese prime time and just take some ratting ships out and and run up some ADMs, activity defense multipliers, which obviously makes the sovereignty harder to attack. So we use our advantages in EU and USTZ to sort of set the stage for those off time zone ops when we need to fight fraternity when they're the strongest so things like putting infrastructure down as i said doing blackouts 
Cloaky camping campaigns are a pretty common tactic used by just about every Nullsec alliance in the game in order to deny the enemy's ability to PvE and run up the ADMs in, that, in those systems, as well as make the... Uh, generally, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of like tacticals, like strategic goals, and it's a lot of psyops. It's a lot of, you know, psyching out the enemy and, and making them not... making them feel less safe in their space is the first steps. And I'll also throw out that some of it is also rallying our own people. Like, you know, we've been fighting the war for a while, at least B2 as as a coalition. And so it's it's really important, especially when you're starting to transition into more offensive ops, that, you know, you get everybody on the side because we're going to have to be alarm clocking for some of these timers, like fighting an off TZ alliance. We're going to run into the same problems that fraternity was, fraternity was when they attacked us, where most of our folks aren't in like the Chinese and Asian time zones. So it's really important that when we actually do a major op and we're waking everybody up for it, that we achieve, you know, achieve the objectives. Yeah, you don't want to put in lots of effort only to lose. That That can be really detrimental to morale, especially when people are having to be awake and cranky at like 3 a.m. in the morning. There, There is a follow-up question to Shattered, your comment about like the cloaky camping. I know that used to be super important in the past where it was really easy to kind of shut down entire constellations or regions from ratting just by cloaky camping. But now there are counters to cloaky camping with the mobile observatories. I believe they're called mobile observatories. I might have gotten the name wrong. But how do you how do you handle cloaky camping where you can't just like log an account right after downtime and then AFK, you know, kind of with that psyops where you actually have to have people manning it and flying it in order to not get caught out and killed. So the original problem with cloaky camping is it was it was far too easy to do what I was talking about as far as suppressing a region and engaging in those kinds of psyops without having to be anywhere near your computer. All you needed was a bunch of clients, all omega You logged them in in the morning when you went to work, or you VPNed and you remoted into your computer and launched all these clients at that after downtime. They would sit in system cloaky camp all day. They would be AFK all day. It would be pretty inconsequential unless you were at your keyboard and coordinating with a black ops group to actually hit the routers in those systems. But as I say, there is still a psychological, significant psychological factor to having those characters present in that in your what is supposed to be your safe routing space. It, it's funny because I have seen it time and time again where we've been under cloaky camping campaigns over the years and they might hit two, three targets a day. They might be killing vexers and letting the carriers go just because they don't have the numbers on the when the carrier routers are out, things like that. And yet it it absolutely has a significant impact in the your industrial and your ratting output of a region just because of the fact that it's it's spooking people that are not, you know, don't want to, you know, rat and mine in a system where they know there is a hostile black ops dropper. The mobile observatories definitely added a little bit of balance to the, the system. I wouldn't say they're perfectly, it's per, still perfectly balanced because it's still a, takes minimal effort to circumvent them, but it's impossible to do short of scripting without being at your keyboard because if you're cloaky camping even just one constellation well that's five to ten accounts that every single count if there's observatories running in those systems you need to manually be at your keyboard cycling your cloak and risking getting caught well during that decloak period before you can cloak again by an observatory pulse the issue right now with the observatory pulses is the well, there's a f the, the problem right now, I would say, definitely is the cost. The fact that it's a structure that can be killed fairly easily. It, it was designed to basically give SAW owners some ability to defend their space from cloaky campers. And the AFA, AFK cloaky camping was definitely not a, a fair mechanic, and they did a good job of that because now you, you basically cannot AFK cloaky camp because the minute an observatory goes up in the system, you need to log that character off or it's going to get decloaked pretty reliably within the first couple pulses because it's a 40% decloak chance after your cloak invulnerability runs its course, which is the first 15 minutes after cloaking up. But I still think there's some issues with, one, the cost of the observatories 
and two, the like the the cycle time, I guess you could say, to deploy an observatory for about sixty million ISK and have it run for I believe it runs for an hour and a half, maybe just a little bit more than that. It it's a one off. Like you you can deploy, you can pay fifty million ISK, and that system might not have a cloaky camp for two hours, or they might have a cloaky camper that's having to sit at his keyboard and is not AFK, which now means he's not doing something else. Or if he is AFK and you have the right characters, the right combat probers, you have a chance of catching his hunter. Now, hunters are really cheap, and that was the other thing I wish they would do is maybe up the requirements for hunting because, you know, covert ops, frigates, bombers, literally just any T1 frigate with a cloak fitted to it can function as a cloaky camper. It doesn't need to be sino-capable, cover-capable, doesn't even have tackle. It just has to be in system, right? And then once they have those eyes, they can then follow up by bringing a proper hunter into the region for an actual blobs drop, for example. Alrighty, so it's it's around here. Sorry, but uh, you know. No, that's good. No, I was just curious as to, I I mean, in my opinion, I think this is like the first time we're having like a war where if you're trying to actually gain solve at some point, right? Like fraternity wants. B2 solve, fire once, fraternity solve, right? So either way, it's actually, you're actually having to use cloaky camping beyond just, hey, I'm going to say AFK. And because of that, the strategy has changed. I don't think, I'm trying to remember how it was during World War B2 or Vietnam. I'm not 100% sure if that change had come out during that war or if it was after. So it's interesting to see how the dynamic has changed and how players are now having to adapt because of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if if you learn the new mechanics, like CCP introduces the mechanics, and you either can embrace it and try to work with it and try to make it work, or someone can look at it and be like, oh, this is broken, or it's too expensive, or it's pointless, and not bother. But we took the mechanics given to us, we took the tools we had available, and we we got some people together that wanted to learn how to do it and wanted to hunt cookie campers, and they're very successful at it now. We have a SIG that dedicates their time to to going after cloaky campers, once they log in, they hunt them down and kill them more often than not, or at the very least, force them to log off and keep our space clean. Because that's all it is. It's just it's about it's about keeping the space clean and making the cost of doing business as far as cloaky camping as difficult as possible for them. If they if they need to take spend a huge amount of time juggling 10, 15, 20 alts, constantly logging them off and on, constantly cycling their cloaks watching for new observatories drop dropping suddenly they're now uh, they don't even have time to look for ratting targets they're just trying to keep their characters from getting killed yeah sorry i'm watching artemis scroll through this so she's showing off like the mobile observatory is getting lost it looks like people are actively not only cloaky camping but counter trying to counter the cloaky camps with these mobile yeah. observatories yeah it would be nice to see them get a little bit of an ehp buff too they 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 are fairly easy to pop they can really only be used in fr in friendly space. They can't really be used offensively because they're just, you know, a couple frigates, a couple of interceptors can warp in and nuke one before anyone has a chance to respond, which is a little annoying at times. And they show on the overview no matter what, right? So it's like really uh, easy to warp to them or do you have to probe them now? As too? long as your overview is configured correctly, yeah. They okay, deploy and then 10 minutes after being deployed, they do their first pulse and they pulse every 10 minutes after that. Oh, that's another, that would be another nice little balance pass if they actually hid the number of pul the pulse time, because you can show info on it at any time and actually see when the next pulse is happening, because it happens in 10-minute intervals. I gotcha. Okay. So, because it's like any other deployable that has a lifespan, you show info on it, it shows you the life remaining on it before it, before it expires. And so you just show info, and if the next, every time it rolls down another 10 minutes, you know you're going to get another pulse. So they're easy to predict as well. I gotcha. So Artemis is showing us average camping enjoyer. Is that part of B2 or is that part of fraternity side? So Akina That's Mountain rough. Akina That's Mountain rough. is a contracted cloaky camping organization that, okay. has been, that has been hired by Winterco to cloaky camp B2 space. I'm guessing they've been around longer than just this war because they actually have a alliance logo, so it's very fitting. Yeah, they've been doing it for a long time. They're they're very good, and they they were good at adapting to the the observatories as well. So, like even though the play style has changed a bit, there's still folks that are willing to sit down and do it for hours. All right, awesome, very interesting. I was gonna 
segue, but now I kind of forgot where I was going to segue. Oh, the fights that have been happening over the last week. So we didn't talk about the big fight that happened last week, Sunday. Artemis, I think, has those BRs pulled up. And then and then any of the fights this current week. So I don't do you guys want to talk about the big fights, sort of the objective, how you see your wins or your losses? Sure. I mean, the big fights that happened were definitely over our uh, over removing the roach motels that were in our space. And uh, so far that over the last couple of weeks, that's been very successfully accomplished. I was away the last few days, but it looks like we killed four more fraternity fortizars this weekend. Which is not too bad. Those those ones didn't have a fight, right? Those are just bashes. It's a hit or miss. I don't think Fret moved much this weekend. They they definitely. I don't want to go so far as to say they were licking their wounds over the over the previous fights over the Keep Stars and the Forts, but they were not really able to get any momentum back in C and T Z with the Imperium joining us in these fights as well. So they've they've definitely. They definitely appear to have cut their losses as far as the offensive structures they had deployed in our space. Alrighty. So you call them offensive structures. Do you want to, is that what a roach motel is just in general? Or is, do you mean something else when you say roach motel? So a roach motel generally is just any kind of structure being deployed in your space to be annoying. And I call them roach motels because if these structures were being used for any strategic purpose, they would have been an actual threat, and we would have made a lot more effort to remove them a long time ago. As it stood, they deployed, I want to say, a dozen and a half Fortizars and three Keep Stars in our space, and did precisely nothing with them for nine months. So, like, they freeported the one in FTAC N, which is Brave's old staging. They put a market in it. Like... They they put some Fortizars on gates where they could j- jump Titans in out of so to play and fade a little more and have some have some exit strategies if they needed them, but they never properly deployed anything. Like the only time that the the only Keep Star that ever gained any significance in the region was the X forty seven one, and that's only because BFL deployed there a couple months ago. Up until that point, the not, none of the structures that they had put down in Pure Blind or Fade had gained any sort of strategic relevance. There's no suppression yeah. of ADMs. There was no like like there was no SIGs or group staging out of them. Like like they just yeah they were just they just deployed a bunch of billions billions of is worth of paperweights that are now billions of is worth of kill mails on killboard because they were not able to defend them either. I I'd, I'd say the biggest effect that they had is really morale. Like at at the end of the day they didn't really strate- like stage anything strategic out of it, but it it definitely has been something that our players did not enjoy seeing in their space and so the fact that they're starting to die now, it's been a really big push momentum wise for us to show that we're taking the offensive now and and securing our space and hopefully invading theirs. Yeah, well I know I was going to say the X47 one spawned that big fight last Sunday. That was, I believe, so it was the Fraternity staging in, in X-47, and I believe they deployed Capitals, like Supers, Titans, Dreads, and then uh, Imperium B2 came in to try and not only bash that one, but then bash all the other Keep Star timers. I want to say it was like 3 a.m. my time. And so I know you guys had a big fight there, which people say it was a lot of fun, but I heard it was also not a lot of fun just because of like server weather, which is nothing like new, I think, for like Eve players who have been playing for a while. But yeah, so this is the battle report Artemis is showing. So I believe Which Team one? A is so Team A, I'm assuming is just people who weren't allied anywhere and so they don't really know what side to put them on, so they put them in their own group. Team B is B two, so you can see Brave there along with Imperium Alliances. And then C is Pan Fan plus Winter Co. So yeah, this would have been this would have been our first play on the X forty seven armor timer. So yes. as, as you probably see on Dotland, the X forty seven armor timer, the, there's a, the X forty seven constellation used to belong to mostly Bandalogs, and I think Volta held one of the iHubs as well. They lost that constellation. Most of that's been retaken by Frat, so they own all the iHubs now, which means that they are able to almost entirely sign on jam that constellation, which, like we were talking about earlier, gives them a good bridgehead. 
the X-47 Keepstar being their most defensible Keepstar in the region makes it a great offensive staging. So obviously for both them and us, it is a high priority target if we get a chance to remove it, which is what that fight was. Essentially, this was as close as we were coming at this stage of the fighting to a headshot attempt because removing that Keepstar would have cut off Fraternity from the rest of their Keepstars in the region and would have pushed the front definitely back further into their border, like as close to the, probably right up to the Tribute Regional, or even the UMI Keepstar, if X-47 were to die. And the big key point here is you can't really defend Keepstars on Hall Timers. You can try, but you're really, your hands are very tied on the kind of assets you can deploy for that kind of defense, because if on an Armor Timer, you can put all your caps, all your supers, all your dreads, all that fun stuff on it, and it's fine and dandy, even though the Keepstar goes to haul, you just tether up, dock up, and jump out. On the haul timer, if you have heavy assets sitting on that Keepstar that cannot get untackled and are pinned down when the structure, structure uh, dies, you're then put in a very bad situation. So the heavy fighting always happens over the armor timers, and as you saw, that attempt on X-47 very heavily defended by Wintercoat and their Panfam allies. And so if this was just the armor timer... Whatever or whatever happened to the whole timer then was that also a fight? I so that that armor timer was not successful on our part. That timer. Oh, repaired. it repaired. Okay. Yeah, and predominantly that was uh, we we had some conversations afterwards with uh, between us and and CCP about node reinforcement and uh, things like that. And there was a there was a, a small update the developers put out regarding node reinforcement. Because what had happened is, because we knew we were going to be fighting over multiple systems, we'd requested many systems be reinforced. And as it turned out, turns out the number of systems that were reinforced was actually greater than the number of systems CCP could reinforce. So some systems were put on the same node as X-47, which meant that there was a huge amount of, like, X-47 basically was running unoptimally because the node had not just that system on it, but it had other systems on it as well. That explains some of the server weather issues that I heard. Like I know, yes. I know it's the fighting started before downtime, and then obviously downtime happens. Everyone logs back in, but I heard there was like at some point the node actually crashed, which is just a headache and a half to try and deal with as a player, yes. and probably at CCP's end. The node death occurred, I want to say about 20, 30, 40 minutes before downtime. So approximately ten thirty is when. Essentially, what happens during no death is is you start realizing that everyone's clients stop responding. Your outstanding calls go in excess of ten minutes. Basically, everything grinds to a halt, and and you'll you'll see people in the fleet mass reporting that I can't either I can't log in because I crashed, or my modules are decycling, or I didn't receive that warp. Things like that, right? No death is pretty apparent, and. It was unsurprising that when we had over 6,000 people in that system that no death eventually occurred. We have a very, it's, it's not hard to tell how reinforced nodes get mapped around once the, reinf once the node mapping occurs. So we knew what systems were on the X-47 node. And it was very unfortunate that it was a system that we already had like an, an extra five, 600 people in when we were trying to bridge them into systems. So it really, really did not, really did not work out well in, in our favor the way the node mapping looked for that fight. We, yeah. were, we were doing some napkin math about DPS and, and server ticks, and, and it's, it's rather unfortunate that the way the mechanics are currently with Citadel Reinforcement is that despite being in time dilation, the structure repair timer will tick down in real time. And when you're in time dilation, your amount of damage you need to apply to the structure to actually cap it increases proportional to your time dilation, right? Yep. And so, so it creates these all these issues when trying to structure bash while yeah. in tie die. Yeah. So for example, your 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 seventy thousand DPS that you need to damage cap a keep star in zero percent tie dye, well you multiply that number by a factor of ten. So you now need to apply seven hundred thousand DPS continuously to damage cap it in max tie dye or greater, because as we know, ten percent tie dye is not where tie dye actually stops. That's where the number stops counting down. Yeah. So sorry, I'm reading Twitch chat. Nick's talking about how how much how many there were in system, and then Artemis is also replying. Nobody bats an eye, and like I, uh, 
I remember after Vietnam ended, I was I was like, man, people always have these fights, and I'm like, I don't care. It's less than it's like less than a hundred bill, like not even a thousand people. Who cares? And like now we're finally seeing those fights come back, and I'm really excited for it. I don't like flying in them, granted, but I'm excited to see these fights again. Oh, absolutely, and we're all gluttons for punishment. Like we'll come back any any after you know a reasonable cool off period and be like, all right, send me back in. We're ready for another one of these massive fights. So I know this fight had, there's a lot of structures listed, but it was more than just the X-47 Keepstar. I know, I think you mentioned all the other Keepstars in the region died that belonged to Fraternity. And now now I think you said you were doing some un, uncontested structure bashes just to kind of clear things out. Is X-40, I'm assuming X-47 is like what you still need to hit before you invade Fraternity space? Or does Fraternity have any, like, so me being outside of the war, not knowing, does Fraternity have anything else? within kind of your space space slash area that it needs to be considered before even going on the like full offensive, like sieging of branch sort of thing. Well, surprisingly enough, we managed to basically raise all the fraternity offensive structures out of our space within about two weeks time. <laughs> Actually, believe it or not, two to three weeks there, we've, we've, we've cleared most of the offensive stuff. Obviously X-47 remains, but that, that's a, a totally different beast to crack just by nature of the fact that they have the iHub and the jammer control and it's so close to their staging too. And also the fact that they've at this stage redeployed most of their assets to UMI, which is in direct bridge range of X-47, whereas we need to mid to get into X-47, which we can't even do if the jammers are up, obviously. Is, it, is that in tribute too? Yes, UMI is their next Keepstar back in the fraternity Keepstar chain. I gotcha, okay. And so in theory, if you're trying to take over their space, you just follow follow the Keepstar chain. Pretty much, yeah. Off. The keeps okay. the Keepstars are the the Keepstars are the focal points. Like the Keepstars are the the set piece. Like once the Keepstar in that area falls, you know that they don't have control over that area anymore. But the 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 real you know deciding factor obviously is whenever the I hubs crack. Once you're cracking I hubs, and uh, once the soft starts dropping, and and they lose that ability to put down a jammer net and and you know once the strategic index is reset everything goes back to zero it's a level playing field no one can jam no one can put you know ansiblexes or beacons down no one can anger structures faster than the other side reset the playing field that opens up a very obvious avenue of attack so yeah definitely definitely the i hubs are where where you you see those those lines getting pushed yeah, that was that's why I asked about the iHubs earlier. But curiosity question, because you brought it up, Ansiplexes. I hear from a lot of people they hate Ansiplex gameplay. Are you seeing Ansiplexes play like a huge role in this, either in your favor or against your favor, or are they just another mechanic involved in nullsec war politics? Politics more than war, because within a particular region, like fraternity, obviously they control six regions so six and a half i believe they only like half a gemini you know when when you control six and a half regions you need ansiplexes and be able to move around there's no way they would be able to actually defend that sub and react quickly enough across like all the way up to branch all the way down to gemini all the way over to tribute like looking at the distance distances involved is just it's just, they, there's no place that they could single place they could stage from and titan bridge to or use regional gates to their advantage to actually defend all this space even in their prime time it would just be too much so from a defensive standpoint yeah the ansiplexes are important if you plan on holding three or more regions sure if you have a plan on holding one to two regions you can probably get away without it you just gotta be smart about where you put your staging where you put your keep stars bridge titans that sort of thing politically though politically and wolfie you might want to touch on this a bit too when you have ansiplexes and your neighbor or someone you can ally or bat phone has ansiplexes, and you can, on the flick of a switch, give them access to your ansiplexes, and now you're not talking about projecting across one or two regions, you're talking about projecting them across as many regions as you can get, right? So we had several before PanFam, well, PanFam still officially hasn't deployed to PureBlind, but for the timers that PanFam was coming in for, it was very much a drop of the hat. They would form out of their staging in Kalaval, I want to say. And they would make their way through the Fraternity Ansiblex network to Pure Blind for a timer or to Tribute for a timer. And it basically 
turned it basically cut their number of jumps down from like 30 to 40 down to you know eight to ten jumps from their staging and now they're now in umi sitting on a frat titan about to bridge into the fight like it, it's it's a huge it, it's it's kind of like the days of old back before jump fatigue was a thing and your biggest fear about using caps or supers was not the fact that the enemy is going to fight you there it's that pl from the other side of the game is going to log in a sino chain and be on top of you in like 10 minutes you know before jump fatigue was a thing and they could just chain jump 10 15 10 15 sinos log them in all at once and have a super fleet ready to drop on you in a heartbeat right that was the big you know balance factor that brought forth jump fatigue and re definitely rebalanced capital and super capital gameplay and that's the problem that uh Ansiplex is created but only within the subcap environment where now you can maneuver massive subcap fleets around. The big problem with that is that subcap gameplay is now a lot more influential due to the cost of using capitals and how expensive they are to produce. You see a lot more fights being determined through use of subcaps rather than caps. Caps have their place, but it's the strategic cost of using them is very high now because just how much it costs to build the things and how. Uh, how much more valuable they are. All right, I gotcha. And I know you mentioned Wolfie could talk about it too of Ansiplexes. I don't know if that had any play with Imperium and them coming up to help of being able to help, I don't know, bridge them into the fight faster too, or if it's just a consideration of being on the defensive against Fraternity and PanFam. Yeah, I mean, I can give like a little bit of the higher level aspects of it. Yeah. So when you're asking an ally to come and help you out, so one of the things that absolutely comes up is Ansiplex. They're incredibly important to be able to maneuver fleets. It, it cuts down on travel time so much, and you don't have to have somebody logged into a Titan waiting that could potentially be bumped or fleet warped if they're if they're being stupid. So like, there's definitely coordination that happens when you're doing a mass deployment. All that kind of ACL stuff is going to get worked out. Like I got sent a massive list of everybody that would be coming. Basically, all that stuff gets worked out a couple days in advance. You anchor new Ansiplex facing from their region if you need to. So it, it definitely is a big part. It's part of the, those like negotiations that happen before you get a big group showing up to a war. Alrighty, awesome. And then I know Artemis had tagged in. So we also have Shen in chat too. Shen, I don't know if you want to say hi, introduce Hello. yourself. If, Hello. if you, yeah. yeah, you fly with Fraternity, right? Jakaris. Jakaris, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this was like the brave power hour, so you're kind of getting caught up here. Yeah. And then everyone's saying hi to my cat, who's not going to talk. But yeah, Shen, are you involved in this war at all? Have you been partaking, yeah. <laughs> having fun? I mean, that alarm clock fight in X-47, that was there. A couple of fights after that, too. I mean, I think one of the things we mentioned before was on the hall timer of, of Keepstars. We have seen a test for that on the 5ZXX Keepstar. Right, the paladin flea that died essentially on that keep star from pandemic horde plus frat. That's a good example of what not to do, pr pretty much on a how timer of a keep star. But yeah, oh, yeah. On the topic of plex, one of the things that horde did is they only deploy their heaviest doctrine, which is the paladins, to the front line because, to be honest, to Goblin's point. It is pretty easy for them to just fly all the way from back there with Ansiplexes. So yeah. Yeah. So if they're doing smaller, smaller uh, fleets, it's like cruisers or whatnot, as very easy to catch up. As long as they can afford those Ansiplex fees. Yeah, that and Ozones, which is a byproduct of every ice at this point. <laughs> oh yeah, because it does take ozone. I have heard. What is it? So when I was in PL, sometimes we would do this where you're moving caps. We'd be like, okay, let's just move a capital through the Ansiplex. And then, like, we'd have to preemptively let, like, I think it was always hoarding Ansiplexes. We'd let them know, like, hey, sorry, we used all your fuel. Here's, like, we're going to refill it. Don't worry. Because it's such a detriment if you have, like, a whole fleet coming, but then somebody put a capital through because the Ansiplexes can only hold so much ozone, ozone. So that's, like, some of the logistics limiting factors with Ansiplexes. Yeah, the worst comes in when you put a cap through Ansiplex. That's when the logic slippers are going to start yelling. Yeah, and yeah. I don't blame them. I don't want to. I'll go on, Wolfie. Definitely yelled at fire a little bit for it. I've had our own folks like put, put you know, 
the, we've had people run dreads through and stuff with it. It just it happens, and just be nice and refill them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I know you had brought up the Golden Fleet. I don't think we've shown that BR. I remember seeing. Is that this one? These are all capitals. I have no oh, idea. The one that has lost a trillion on it. Yeah, that one. That's that's a memorable one. Yeah, I'm trying to see. I'm seeing if Artemis can pull it up. No pressure, Artemis. Well, there's some dead paladins, but they were horde paladins. Yeah, horde paladins. It, it should be that one. The one, the one that Artemis was on before. Yeah. If you go on summary, that's easier to see. Oh, okay. Yeah, right here. Paladins, 109. Yeah, so what happened there? Were the paladins stage on a Keepstar hold timer? So when the Keepstar died, they all died? Or what, what happened much, here? From what I heard, yeah. Okay, so that that kind of goes to I, I think Shattered made that point. You two have were there. I wasn't there personally, but I've heard like a lot of reports about it afterwards. But yeah, many were trying to log off, basically dock up and then log off. That's an and then you just don't log back in afterwards. That's the way to do it, or just warp off and then try to do a, like a local structure and then log off as well. That's the way to do it. But yeah, this it's a lot of loss right there. And also a lot of dreads lost in there too. Yeah, I am excited to see people use dreads. I want to see titans and supers die, but I feel like we gotta get through the dreads and the carriers first. I always, I always like seeing expensive stuff die. But this is interesting because, like, I want to say since the marauder was it the marauder changes? No, the rollback of what was it? Surgical strike. The rollback of surgical strike. A lot of folks started using like the paladin fleets and other sort of those battleship fleets, and now we're starting to see them be really critical in these fights. And then also, I mean, obviously we're gonna have the losses, but it's it's been this has been really interesting. There is a question: How are ships getting replaced in this war? Are are people? Do you guys have? I say you guys, but I mean in general, are people? Do they? Is it like groups have the pre-built stock? I know Kenneth talks about it a lot when he talks about PL. Or is this kind of a logistics nightmare where you're having to ship, you know, ship ships in or ship material in to build them? How's that looking? It's not particularly difficult logistically to maintain subcap fights. You do sometimes have issues, like especially things when you start getting to T two battleship holes. Those definitely take some serious industrial manpower to replace like we we definitely we only run two faction battleship doctrines in b2 we run nightmares and we run uh tfis and uh, and and they 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 take the like the entire coalition needs to, to put to put forth some some heavy industry in order to keep those ships replaced it's not as though that they can't it's not like they can't be replaced it just may not you may not be whelping a 200 man paladin fleet every night now, Panfan Fan and Fraternity, obviously, they have much larger industrial backing, so they could sustain those losses, and they definitely would be smart of them to cash those ships if they intend to use them for long periods. But it's not, in the grand scheme of things, like, if you're talking about fights throughout, like, a week, like a Monday to Friday thing, if you had to whelp a Paladin fleet on Saturday, you could have another Paladin fleet ready to go the following Saturday. Like, it's definitely, it's not that difficult. It's when you start talking about capitals and super caps that are capitals, particularly that long term effects of losing a fleet are much more significant. And uh, super capitals, as we all know, are still basically irreplaceable. All righty, I got you. So, all I'm hearing is people will be whelping more battleships, but definitely, hopefully, not whelping as many capitals because those are more complicated to replace. I, for one, welcome our new battleship meta overlord. I am happy to see battleship fleets being relevant again in the year of our lord. Yeah, I always, I mean, I don't know. I'm super biased. I love fight. I love watching expensive stuff die, but I also love watching like entertaining fights. And so far, I mean, given the fact that this has only been going on maybe a month tops, it felt like it was like declared and then everyone, like I was a naysayer, Artemis was a naysayer. We're like, this isn't going to be a war. Nobody's going to do anything. And then sure enough, we have like a week straight of like nonstop fighting, it seems. Oh yeah, we definitely hit the ground running. There was no, there was no holding back. We wanted to make sure that the opening moves of this of this fight, we we made some statements about what our intentions were going forward. Like yeah, there had been some threats beforehand from from like PH for example that if Imperium showed up to to help with the, our, our end with the war that they would deploy. Decision just so like, well, yeah, kind of we are, but decision just kind of got made at the end of the day that like we've been fighting Frat for nine months at this point. It was kind of stalemated out. 
Like we wanted to go on the offensive, and at the end of the day, if PH, if PH is going to come anyway, we're just going to go ahead and and invite Imperium up to have some fun. Like everybody wants content. Nullsec's been stagnant for like two years now, so it was it was about time to get the war running. Yeah. So also another curiosity question. So we were talking about dreads, and we've seen dreads. I mean, they're on this kill mill here. What about carriers? Are carriers still used in these fights? I remember World we, War. Well, sorry, one. Break up the lost mill for the F second keepster. If the carriers kill it. F second and Rory were both killed by carriers. Nice. They were okay. they were skynetted. They were used from siege fort as ours, but. Okay, so they're still they still have a, a purpose, kind of similar to what it was with the last major wars. What about someone in chat's asking about munins? So I know munins had this revolutionary change, but are people still using those at all, or hacks in general? Hacks still definitely have their place. The biggest change we saw is that we went from a when munins online was was all the rage. We were very much in a it was actually a kiting meta, which is funny because munins are much better in a brawl, but. Definitely your use of standoff doctrines, so things like the HML Serbs that could hit out to 180 kilometers, BD doctrines, Eagles that could hit up to 130, Munins that liked to brawl, preferred to be in close range, but could also volley targets from easily out to 80 90 kilometers even after their last couple rounds of nerfs. We were very much in a skirmishing, long range, kitey meta. After the hack rebalance and the Munin changes happened, well, Munins were right off. They were off the table. They were no longer the apex predator of Nullsec because you couldn't kill anything up to and including battleships and capitals with just putting enough Munins on grid. That was out of the question. Munins still have their place. Ham Munins, HML Munins both have relevance as skirmishing doctrines. They still are the fastest, heaviest assault cruiser that is viable in a fleet setting in the game. Sorry, frat, vagabonds just don't cut it. Go back to the drawing board with that one. But when it comes to the Nullsec subcap gameplay meta outside of the battleships, anything battle crews are down, we're definitely now shifting into a, a more interesting meta, which, which is why we've seen so many armor hacks come back into play. Because armor hacks are really good at brawling. You get up on top of an enemy fleet, you get under their guns, you sig tank, and you're able to essentially sit on top of an enemy fleet and be in a position where they can't track you and you're able to use a lot of close range supports. We see a lot of things like support nesters coming back into null sec. We see a lot of vindicators, scorpion navy issues. All these ships that really no one ever really saw in null sec for a very long time are now seeing huge use in fleet fights because they make great support boats if you are fighting an enemy fleet at zero. If you're able to get up right on top of their face and get those heavy scrams, get those grapplers in, Suddenly now you are you're able to stand your ground with doctrines that historic the biggest disadvantage to them ages ago was just anyone that wanted to, didn't want to fight you would just run away from you. And when everyone is running a skirmishing doctrine, bringing a brawling doctrine to the fight and having them all just sit at their sit at their max range and throw rocks at you from well in the case of Serbs up to two hundred kilometers away doesn't give you a lot of ability to hold the grid and actually get a fight because everyone could just sit outside your range. Now that we're seeing this brawling gameplay come back and a lot of use of heavy assault cruisers and short range, rep, short range weapons like hams and HMLs, it's definitely a very different meta shift. And of course, the surgical strike and battleship buffs have definitely made battleships a uh, the apex predator they always should have been. I'm excited for it. Someone in chat did ask, so we're talking a lot about battleships, what about ravens? I know we are looking at a lot of armor battleships, but what about those shield battleships? Every time one of my FCs asks for a cruise Raven Doctrine, a little piece of me dies. Very strong opinions, then. Let me try to read um, chat. It's, it, cruise missiles are probably my least favorite weapon system in the game. It's just a personal preference, though. Some people like them, but a lot of people look at their numbers on Pyfe and think, oh, this is great, and don't realize they can't hit the broadside of a barn with them. Yeah, and also under heavy tie-dye, missiles are... Not that good. But also That's another thing with the carriers is like when the when all the carriers on grid plus our fighters, that like that it gives the server is real. If you're on the defending side, that actually helps a lot. Like Munings put ECM drones out, everyone has five of them. All fighters are out. That's a lot of calculating that the server has to do to to jam it out. That's I guess the your type of thing that the fighters can do. But yeah, strategic use of 
mechanics, which knowingly affects server performance, is kind of it's a thing right now. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but if both sides are using it, there's not much I could say about it, right? It is what it is. It's just another mechanic that we are using in NullSec because when you're in a war for survival, you don't have any choice but to use every tool at your disposal to win. As long as I, it doesn't meet CCP's definition of abuse. I have always heard that players will do the best they can to attempt to crash the server. Because if you're not crashing the server, then that just means you can cram more people into a fight and have a bigger fight. I but, mean, uh, that's, that's always been the argument I've heard ever since starting this game was that for the longest time, people are just like, oh, the server can only hold 100 people in system. Well, let's just cram 100 people then. And then that escalates and every tool available, etc. Yeah, it's definitely started to show its its limitations of like the original tech and and how it can utilize servers and cores. But it's at at this point, you know, you just cram as much stuff into a system as you can and hope for a fun fight. A lot of people don't realize that during the M two fight, the big M two fight, when the server died and all those ghost titans got trapped, there was six thousand people in system, almost seven thousand when no death occurred. There was. 4,000 more people waiting to jump in. That If yep. the servers were built for it, that was going to be a 10,000-person battle, but the servers never would have been able to handle it. Yeah, and that's that's what sucks is like, especially when you see some of these fights getting ready to kick off, like you notice, ton, like you'll have 3,000 people in system, but if nobody's doing anything, right, nobody's shooting guns or running smart bombs or drones or warping or whatever they just all sit in there server handles it fine right like that's why Jita has like a thousand to two thousand people every day but the moment people start doing something like anything like even if it's just cycling your guns the server just goes downhill and it becomes a tie-dye fest yeah and the, and and i'm gonna kind of step in on wolfie's territory here and talk about the politics behind it but the part of the part of the problem we always we always see this happen now these days in null sec fights is the way everything is trended towards the block style gameplay and having large coalition basically be the end state for anyone who wants to do anything large in the game when you when you have you know 80 percent of null sec living in either pan fam winter co or in imperium where does uh, where does anyone who wants the best advantages presented them go? You go into one of those two groups. And the reason we fought so hard against Fraternity is if we lose a single iHub to Fraternity up until, you know, Imperium deployed and then the dynamic shifted, it was essentially regarded as being gone for good. No, no group in the game outside of one of the other major blocks, of which one of them is blue with, the, with Fraternity, is ever able to retake that system. It's gone to China forever. It's rather unfortunate, but it's just it's the nature of the game and how time zone tanking works and, and the advantages they hold in, in, in their prime time. The, the, the issue is that when, as we said earlier, if you can just cram 6,000 people into a server and, and hit, make the server hit capacity, then you're able to win the fight every time. And, and, and I have always been a proponent of smaller groups being able to kind of hold their own in nullsec, but it's very hard to do that and not just be a stepping stone or a farm source of content farm for one of the major blocks at that same time. It's it's, it's hard for those two groups to exist independently. A very I was very interested to see how the southeastern agreement played out. I think my prediction personally, this is not anything to do with b2 or or any of the other groups that are that are part of that agreement is that eventually all those little small alliances are going to form their own coalition and you will now have a new coalition forming in the in the geographic southeast of the game that is my prediction i would say it probably happened within the next 12 to 18 months but the point is it's it's you really the way the mechanics are and the way that the the way that politics are in the game these days is you don't get very far trying to be an independent alliance we tried that when we first moved to pure blind we didn't have any major agreements with volta aside from the fact that we didn't plan to invade them we were going after bander logs and and the other groups living in the south that they're living in pure blind at the time we stayed independent for almost a year straight i would say before fraternity expand continued expanding outwards and we had no choice but to you know blew up for good or 
blew up for as long as it takes to, to push them back. Because this is the thing, is, is Fraternity spent the last two years expanding across the North. They took Branch, they took Tribute, they took Tenal, and every one of the small groups that were living in those places either had to bend the knee, and most either folded in or became, you know, vassals of Fraternity, or they left. Some of these groups faded out and died. Some of these groups were absorbed into Fraternity. They just, they blew it up and then they were poached or they just they just fizzled out because they weren't designed to be part of a major coalition and a lot of these groups joined us they kept being pushed west and west and west until they found themselves in b2 and gtc space at the time now b2 space and then they just wind up becoming part of our coalition because they had no choice but to get either adapt or die basically they had to either get more allies become a bigger threat find themselves enough man firepower they could hold themselves back against frat or a lot of those groups either just ceased to exist or were absorbed by fraternities advance and that's just the state and also that's that's the thing is groups that are hell-bent on expansionism and don't care the effect it has on the game or the effect it has on if they're if they're so self-concerned about their own this or coalition's growth then it just, it just, this is, it just, human nature takes over. And human nature is, well, there's a reason I'm a cat person. I like the cats more than I do most people. And unfortunately, if you, if you, you know, if you're not dealing with any pleasantries or any, any politics where repercussions are involved, if, because we're all playing in a video game, we're all playing in a sandbox, eventually someone just will want to take over the map. And that is, essentially what fraternity has been doing in the geographic north for the last couple of years and that's why we had to do everything in our power to stop it yeah i get what you're saying and that's yeah i've heard a lot of talk and discussion and debate around the nature of eve and why everyone just ends up in these massive coalitions but i feel like that's a whole other like rabbit hole to go down we could probably spend hours on that and i know artemis has about 10 minutes left i don't know if you guys have any final thoughts that you want to share about how you're feeling with the war, how you how you see the next few weeks going, anything like shout outs to friends or family or anything along those lines. We can start with you, Shen. I mean definitely shout out to like everyone who are like non CNTZ. I mean we have seen they've done like a really, really fabulous job on alarm clocking on like making sure their members and themselves are able to get up during CNTZ. So yeah, it's really, I would say a good job to everyone who are able to do that. Alrighty, thank you. And then Shattered? Shout out to the line members. Like, FCs do a lot of pre-planning work, getting, you know, planning out ops, coming up with tactics and strategies and, and moving sinos and making sure everything fires up. But none of it happens if the line members from every side aren't able to really log in and and form those ranks and, and be willing to go toe to toe with each other. Cause that's, that's really where, where the fights are won and lost is, is how many of your people are willing to, you know, lean on each other and, and fight through the tie dye and fight through the alarm clocks and, 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 you know, show up to hold your ground. Right. We yeah. all do this work. We do all this work so that our line members have something to log in for and something to do, right. Be it a war, be it a, an ADM up, be it a, be it a, defense home defense a standing fleet activity an event whatever it's all done to to give our line members a reason to log in and something to do right so it's good to see everyone enjoying how this war has gone so far and i hope i hope we keep going that way yeah thank you and then wolfie any final thoughts from you or shout outs not a ton i'm, I'm gonna echo the shout out to line members I, I love everybody in brave it's why i've been with brave for like seven or eight years now and uh yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just excited we're finally getting another major war and that Brave is now big enough to be a major player. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And you're, you're the one running all the, the Diplo slash politics in the background, right? You're the, the secret hand of Brave. I, I do a lot of it on the back end, yeah. A lot, a lot of people know me from quick chats and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank, thank you to the three of you for joining us today. I'm assuming this war is going to last longer than a couple more weeks, so we may do another show to kind of get an update. So you guys are more than welcome to come in and join us and uh, give your thoughts and everything. I appreciate you coming on the show. I'm assuming Artemis has no final thoughts, so I will say that she says thank you to everyone for tuning in. 
with that, we are going to end the stream, but uh, stick around. We're going to go raid somebody, and then I will see you guys. Actually, we probably won't be streaming next Sunday, so the Captain's Cup is next Sunday, so stick around for that. We'll probably segue it over to the Monday again, so I will see you within a week, but definitely not on Sunday because we're going to be doing the Captain's Cup, and we don't want to interfere there. But thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a good Monday and a good rest of your week.